I can't tell you how meaningful it is to be here with all of you, even just during the prayer, hearing our voices together saying the Lord's Prayer. It's been a little bit since I heard other voices joining with mine, and it's really special. When I saw that picture of me and my dad, it made me, it's one of my favorite pictures of me and my dad. I think I spent most of my childhood in one of those, in the Haikapus, and um, it reminded me of this story my parents tell of things my dad looks back on and says, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. But he would go downhill skiing with me in that on his back, down, you know, not just greens, but blues, maybe an easy black with me on his back. And I would apparently pat his shoulder and go, don't fall, daddy. <laughs> don't fall. <laughs> so to all those dads and, and father figures out there who don't let us fall, I'm grateful. I also, I wanna make sure everyone in the back can hear me. So if you can't, feel free to scoot up. I know that we're still working out how to do all of this with hybrid, with people here and online. So I wanna make sure everyone can hear. Will you pray with me? Oh God, I pray that this worship is glorious to your ears. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I did it. I did it. I went to the movies. I went to the movies, that's right. For the first time in over a year, I went to a movie theater. I wanted to see In the Heights and I wanted it to see it somewhere than my, other than my couch. I wanted to see the singing and the dancing on a big screen and so I went to the movies. And I was so excited. I put on a nice outfit, even though I knew that no one could see me in the dark theater. I bought tickets to one of those places where you can reserve the seats. And there are those big cushy chairs that recline all the way back. And once I got there, I purchased just a ridiculously large popcorn and soda, bigger than I could possibly eat. And I have never been happier with an overpriced snack. <laughs> Noah and I went to a matinee, so there weren't that many people in our theater. But there was a little girl and her family who were sitting in the row right behind us. I noticed her when we walked in. And she was really quiet for her age. She, she was so quiet, I sort of forgot she was there for most of the film until... There was one scene where I heard her voice. It was during one of the musical numbers and the actors are dancing up the side of a building in Washington Heights. And the little girl gasped. And then she whispered, how are they doing that? And it just was the sweetest moment. And it swept me up along in it to sort of see this moment the way she was seeing it as this impossible, magical, miraculous thing that dancers could go up the side of a building. And that moment really stuck with me after leaving the theater. Maybe it's because I remember that feeling and seeing something in a theater or in a movie that just really captures the imagination, but it also has left me with this question, what do we do when we see the impossible? 
Because for that little girl, the impossible was happening right before her eyes, and it was amazing. Of course, that's not the only response to the impossible. It depends on the context. The impossible can amaze us, but it can also unsettle us or even scare us. Sometimes the impossible actually blurs that line between awe and fear. And we see that this morning in our text with the disciples. They're faced with the impossible and they have no idea how to react. In fact, today's gospel story as a whole feels impossible, or at least maybe a little bit exaggerated. Think about it. Here we have a group of fishermen. Presumably, they're used to the sea, and they're used to storms, and they're used to being on a boat, and yet they're just completely terrified and impaired by this storm. Jesus, on the other hand, is fast asleep. It's almost cartoonish. He's somehow just peacefully napping. Meanwhile, the boat is snapping in the waves. And then, of course, there's that climactic image that we've all seen somewhere. Jesus standing on the prow of the boat with his arms outstretched, rebuking the wind. Mark, the author of the text, doesn't really care if this story sounds impossible or even over dramatic. Mark, if you read the gospel closely, sort of has a flair for the dramatic. Mark cares about what these texts teach us. So if you come to this story even a little bit skeptical, let it sweep you up in the impossible for just a few moments. Mark's gospel, like all the gospels, has defining themes, two of which are discipleship and the identity of Jesus. Mark wants to teach us how we can be disciples and how we should understand Jesus as Christ. And this story is nestled right between a long series of parables the parable of the lamp and the basket, the parable of the sower, the parable of the mustard seed. And then it's followed by three more impossible events. The healing of the garrison demoniac, the healing of the woman with the hemorrhage, and the resurrection of a small child. So in the trajectory of the Gospel of Mark, we're right in the middle section. And this section is all about discipleship and divine power. So keep those themes in mind as we go through this text. I want to read it again for us. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. Jesus' ministry is growing. He's gathering more followers. There's not just one boat, not just two, but we're told that there are several, all of which are going to the other side. And you might be wondering, I hope you're wondering, what is on the other side? Well, it's Gentile territory. Jesus is taking his ministry and his followers from their Jewish context across the sea to a foreign context what some might even have viewed as an inappropriate context. It's only been two verses, and this story has already taught us something about discipleship, right? It's telling us that the gospel should always go to the other side, whatever that might mean for our context. The gospel doesn't stay put in appropriate places. So they go across the sea, and while they're on their way, a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. 
let's pause for one moment and appreciate this cushion. That is such a specific detail. I love the Bible sometimes. In my mind, Jesus is just sleeping on a giant red bean bag. But Jesus was in the stern asleep on the giant red bean bag and they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus was on his cushion. And meanwhile, the sea is stormy. And here's where we have to start thinking about this text, not just literally, but metaphorically. A storm at sea is representative of chaos. This is a common trope in the Hebrew Bible and in many Near Eastern mythologies. The sea is whatever is chaotic and overpowering. Think about the creation story in Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God swept over the face of the deep waters. It's the same sort of thing. So here, the disciples are overwhelmed by chaos while Jesus is asleep. And they're pretty angry about that. Did you notice how they sound accusatory? Jesus, do you not care about us? Do you not care that we are perishing? Well, of course he cares. Jesus isn't asleep because he doesn't care. He's asleep because he has ultimate trust in God. Jesus is not disturbed by the chaos because he knows that God has the final word. And perhaps Jesus is not disturbed because he knows in the words of theologian Tricia Hersey that exhaustion will not create liberation. Jesus knows the power of a good nap. Jesus knows that it's important not to let chaos lead, and he trusts that with God, there's a way. But Jesus is a good shepherd, and he wakes up, and he rebukes the wind and says to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was dead calm. We're at that moment now. We're at the impossible. Jesus calms the storm. And he doesn't do so by asking nicely or by doing some sort of complicated formula. No, Jesus rebukes the storm. Rebuke, that's the same word that's used elsewhere when Jesus rebukes a demonic spirit or rebukes an unclean spirit. Again, we have to think metaphorically here. We have to listen to sort of what's happening beneath the language of the text. Mark is saying something here about divine power. He's teaching us that the divine word transforms great chaos into great peace. The power of Jesus's word transforms chaos to peace. Has anyone here ever experienced that, the power of a good word? Has anyone ever felt in their lives something transform from overwhelming chaos to peace? It makes me think about yesterday, Juneteenth, a new federal holiday, but I think Juneteenth should also be understood as a holy day. A day celebrating the divine word of liberation, a day celebrating the triumph of the good word over the demonic chaos of slavery. I don't mean to suggest that it was just the Emancipation Proclamation that was the divine word or that the message of the Union Army was the divine word, although maybe both were part of it. I mean the collective work it took to end enslavement, the tenacity of enslaved peoples, the blood and sweat and tears that refused to let chaos win, the human spirit that knew that God's good word is enough and is for every single one of God's children. The turning of horrific chaos into peace, that's the power of Jesus's word. And then Jesus turned to them and said, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this? 
that even the wind and the sea obey him. My friends, what do we do with the impossible? How do we react? The disciples, for their part, they freak out. <laughs> the NRSV says they're filled with great awe, but a better translation is that they're filled with great fear. They see Jesus rebuke the storm, the storm they were scared of, and I think they get even a little more scared. And it's not an uncommon reaction in the Bible, right? God and the angels and Jesus are constantly saying to us human creatures, do not be afraid. People are sometimes scared when faced with the impossible, even the miraculous impossible. So we shouldn't be too harsh on our spiritual ancestors here. They're still figuring out who this Jesus is and learning the depth of his power. And I think we shouldn't be too harsh with ourselves when we're afraid. Just like the disciples, we can get mired in chaos. In fact, we've been mired in chaos for over a year, completely overwhelmed by COVID. We lost people. As I stand here, I think about the people who aren't with us together right now. We lost people, we lost opportunities. Our way of gathering was just stripped from our hands. How many of us cried out to God with some version of, do you not care that we are perishing God? I said at the beginning of this sermon that Mark teaches us something about discipleship and about divine power. And for Mark, in order to understand Jesus, you have to face the impossible. There's no way for Mark for you to understand Jesus as Christ without the impossibility, the marvelous impossibility of a love that triumphs over death, of a love that turns chaos into something else. What do we do when faced with the impossible? Sometimes... It amazes us, the miraculous impossibility of Christ, and sometimes it's difficult to grasp, and sometimes we lose sight of it. But this text tells us that that's okay. It's okay to be a fearful disciple. After all, the original ones were fearful disciples, but they still got in the boat to the other side. They followed even when faced with the impossible because they knew that the message was worth the journey. They got in the boat and they stayed in the boat because even if they didn't fully understand it yet, they sensed the divine power, the power to create out of chaos, the power to rebuke evil, the power to transform death to life. I feel like we've made it through one stormy sea, but the thing with being human is there's usually another one. I may not know what stormy seas you're facing right now. For some of you, I do, but for some, I may not. I may not know what chaos is threatening to overwhelm, but I do know that Jesus has the power to transform it. In fact, I believe he's already at work transforming it. Transformation is happening. God is at work this very moment. God is speaking into your life ways to transform that chaos into peace. So stay in the boat. Amen. <laughs>